live in a world where truth is often questioned and distorted and we are too often unsure of what actually is true. Well, today's guest has written a novel that deals with some of these very issues. We are joined today by Mitch Elbum, who is the New York Times bestselling author and who has sold over 40 million copies of his book. His latest book is entitled The Little Liar, available at MitchAlbum.com. Great to have you with us again, Mitch. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Thank, thanks yeah. for having me again. Of course. So first off, maybe give us a little snapshot of what your book is about and, and maybe share a little bit about what inspired you to write it. Sure. Well, it's a book that deals with uh, truth, lying, hope, and forgiveness. And it's set during World War II. It follows the story of a little boy named Nico who's 11 years old. And to that point, his life has never told a lie in his life before. And when the Nazis invade his little town, they find out about him and they decide to use him as a weapon and they steal him from his family and they say, we'll let you go back to your family. All you have to do is stand on these train tracks every day for the next couple of weeks and tell people that they're getting on trains, going to new homes and new jobs. Everything is going to be fine because they're going to be confused. And after you do that, you can go back to your family. So thinking that he's telling the truth because he's never not told the truth and doesn't realize what he's doing. He does this every day and the people who know him to be honest trust him and so they get in these trains. And only on the very last day does he see his own family is being shoved inside one of these boxcars and he finds out that the trains are actually going to the concentration camps and to Auschwitz. And that's when he learns that and to make matters worse, the Nazi who tricked him doesn't let him get on the train. And so the train takes off with everybody that he knows and loves and he's left behind. And the story follows him and three other characters from that point for the next 40 years over the ramifications of that single lie and how that affected him and his brother and the girl that they loved and the Nazi character. So it's a parable about truth and lying um, that covers a great span of time. Wow, uh, that sounds intense. Uh, so this young boy, Nico, he now, I guess, has to deal with the anguish of knowing that he's inadvertently caused Correct. this unspeakable tragedy. And I guess he responds by becoming a liar himself in your book. So do you think that response is fairly common to humanity as a whole? Do we tend to sort of oversteer to try to somehow make up for our mistakes? Yeah, I think if you... Um... If you look at your own lying, and that's one thing I want people who read The Little Liar to sort of come out of saying, well, what's the biggest lie I ever told? What were the ramifications of that lie? And what would I do to be forgiven for that lie? Because that's pretty much what Nico has to do. And I think if you were honest, when we start telling lies, we never stop. You know, we sort of tell one and we say, well, I told that one. I, you know, in order to keep that going, I need to kind of, you know, do a little, I'll just do one more. I'll just tell a little, I'll just exaggerate a little bit more. And we, we tend to sort of compensate or we're ashamed of something as he was. And so we we can instead of admitting it, we cover it up and the cover up becomes more and more complicated as we get older. So what Nico went through, of course, he was tricked. So, you know, he didn't cause the thing. He just was in an inadvertent participant. Uh, but what he goes through, I think a lot of us go through. And uh, the other characters, his brother, who goes to the concentration camp and blames his younger brother and says he's the reason he was in with the Nazis and tries to spend the rest of his life trying to find him to take revenge. Mm -hmm. And this little girl who loved him and thinks the opposite thinks, no, he couldn't have been, he couldn't have known what he was doing. I need to find him so I can forgive him. And she spends the rest of her life trying to find him. He's changed his name. He's changed his identity. He's moved around, but she tries to find him to forgive him. So all these little tentacles that come out of a lie, you know, and the different reactions that we have to it are part of what I try to study and bring forth in The Little Liar. That's interesting. You have truth sort of almost as the narrator of the book. And speaking of truth, it, this is not based on a true story necessarily, is it? Well, it, it isn't, and it is. I mean, obviously, you know, all the stuff that takes place during the Holocaust and the years that follow is actually, you know, based on real events, but the characters are fictional. But this was something actually that the Nazis did they would get Jewish people to stand on the platforms and lie to their own people under threat of death. They would hold their families and say, if you don't do this, we're going to kill your family. And so sadly, there's, there's a, a slice of truth running through the whole story. But you mentioned the, the narrator is the voice of truth. And that really did um, really kind of make the book, to be honest. And the book's been out, you know, a number of weeks now. And 
a lot of people have said to me that that was the most interesting part of it because the book begins essentially with a voice saying, you can trust the story you're about to hear. You can trust it because I'm the only thing in this world you can trust. I'm the shadow you can't outrun. I'm the mirror that holds your final reflection. I am truth. And this is a story about a boy who tried to break me. And I remember when I wrote that page, yeah, I remember when I wrote that page, I said, yeah, I'd like to read that book. You know, if I, I I'd at least turn the page and see where he was going with that. So um, it gave me the opportunity to speak to the whole idea of lying and truth as if truth was having its heart broken, you know, by all the time that humans lie and, and abuse it. Oh, that's uh, that's fascinating. Uh, and Rich, it's also very interesting that the release of your book coincides with this global rise of anti-Semitism that we're seeing following especially this horrible terrorist attack on Israel that took place back in October. So, And of course, we also just observed Holocaust Remembrance Day um, right. just recently. So it's something that people are even denying happened. So any thoughts on why so many seemingly otherwise rational people can vent so much hatred towards Jews and other minorities? Well, uh, you know, I wish I had the answer as to why, uh, because then maybe we could solve it. I can only tell you that it's not new, that anti-Semitism has been around since since the dawn of time. It's the oldest form of hatred, oldest form of hatred in the world, and it rears its head whenever a people get uh, angry or want to blame another people for their woes or for their issues. And that's certainly what happened in Germany, you know, under Adolf Hitler, where he decided to say, if, if we just get rid of the Jews, then we'll be good, you know, and he rallied an entire country around that idea that somehow the Jews were the cause of their misery, which, of course, wasn't even slightly true. And you see a lot of that stuff going on today. And, you know, there was unfortunately, it was a Nazi who said this very prophetic sentence a lie told once is easily seen as a lie, but a lie told a thousand times becomes the truth. And this is what we're dealing with today, you know, where there are a lot of lies that are put out there. Now, I, I just read a, st a study, which is shocking, that one in five Americans under uh, the age of, I, I think, 30 um, think the Holocaust is a myth. One in five people think the Holocaust is a myth. Now, zero percent of people over 65 thought it was a myth. So what does that tell you? That as time passes, people start to forget or they buy in new forms of history. The people who were over 65 were there. They were alive at the time. If anybody you should be listening to, it's them. They were there. They're the ones who say, no, it wasn't a myth. And yet you have young people coming along, buying a lie that's been put out a thousand times that, oh, it's exaggerated and whatever. And they start to take it as the truth. It's a very, very dangerous thing. Yeah. And of course, today we're seeing people saying things like, well, that's my truth. What's your truth? Right. It's becoming kind of distorted, like you said. So why is objective truth so difficult to nail down? Because it makes people uncomfortable because they may have to admit that they were wrong about something or they may have to admit that their guy or their candidate or their person or their take maybe isn't right. But it's easier to just Keep turning the dial until you find someone who says, no, you're right. They're wrong. OK, that's my truth. You know, I, I, I almost laugh at that phrase. You know, my truth. You, what, what people mean is my story. And the world is full of individual stories. And that's true. And we should respect everybody's story. But that doesn't change what's empirically true in the world. You can't say, well, my truth is that I was abused. And so therefore, I get to abuse other people. No, you don't. That's still bad. If you do that, it's bad. And just because you went through it and your truth was you suffered doesn't mean that you get to abuse other people and it's not causing suffering for them because it's your truth. You know, and you can see how that phrase can get just twisted around to justify almost anything. So we have to understand that there's one truth. And that's what the voice of truth and the little liar kind of does. It says, no, you you can't treat me like it's a buffet. You know, take a slice of this and a slice of that. I won't take that. I'll leave that. I'll put that. That's not what truth is. Truth is is a meal that you have to eat. And, uh, and sometimes you may find it distasteful, but it is what it is. There's only one truth. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, your book addresses the power of lies. And some people might ask, are little lies okay? Uh, you know, some people might, might see it that way. Your thoughts? Well, yes. I mean, does this, does this uh, dress make me look fat? 
is uh, certainly something that we have learned that there's a good answer for, and then there's a good answer <laughs> yeah, Don't for. answer that. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, or there's no answer for. Right. And I think most people know the difference between a small lie, and, you know, prevarication, and one that does harm. You know, and the, and the other antidote to that, because we all do lie, so we can't pretend that we don't live in a world that doesn't lie, but the antidote to, to it is forgiveness. And this book is as much about forgiveness as it is about lying. Uh, you know, I always say that ever since Tuesdays with Maury, which is the book people probably know me the most for, um, all of my books have a piece of Tuesdays with Maury in them, whether I mean to or not. And certainly the little liar does because Maury and I talked a lot about forgiveness. He was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease and I visited with him every Tuesday until the end of his life. And we did like this last class together and what's really important in life when you know you're going to die. And one of the things that he said to me was, you need to forgive everybody, everything, no matter how much they hurt you, or whatever, if you care about them, or if you love them, forgive everybody, everything and forgive yourself. And this was something that plays very large in The Little Liar because Nico spends the rest of his life from 11 years old all the way until he's in his 60s trying to be forgiven for what he did and and trying to um, make up for it. And other people try to find him to forgive him. So that's a huge theme as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you're just talking about that theme of forgiveness that's kind of throughout your book there. Um, it, is this the only hope maybe that we have to overcome the violent hatred that is so common in our world right now? Well, yes. I mean, uh, and, and I think you, you actually maybe inadvertently said the word that is to me the antidote to all of it, and that's hope. Um, you know, I, I have actually been teased uh, in my career or criticized uh, about being too hopeful in my books. Uh, and in fact, there was a critic who wrote a whole you know, slamming review of one of my books. And at the end, he dismissed me, just said, oh, he's just the king of hope, you know, meaning it as an insult. And I kind of thought, well, that's not so bad. Right. You know, I wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind that. Uh, and I think that we have to have hope no matter how dire the circumstance. And I created a scene based on some stories that I was told by people who survived the Holocaust in The Little Liar, in during the Holocaust in a concentration camp, where the grandfather of Nico's grandfather, grandfather of the family, every night gathers his family members together and whispering so the guards can't hear them, he forces them to say one good thing that happened to them during the day that they are grateful to God for. And you think, well, what could you possibly say in a concentration camp that you could be grateful for? And one says, well, today I snuck an extra spoonful of soup. Or one says, my rotted tooth fell out. One says, the guard who always beats me was on today so I didn't get beaten. One says, I saw a bird. You know, and what is it inside human beings that despite the worst of circumstances, we still search for hope. We still want to find some reason to believe that tomorrow will be better than today. That thing that's inside of us, to me, is divine. That's divine. And that is what carries us through the next day. It's not something that animals have. You know, animals don't measure you can't measure an animal's optimism, you know, uh, animals just survive, but we not only survive, but we look for the next day to be better. And that is how you deal with not only the issue of lying today or, or, or conflict, but really all the problems that face mankind is that we have to hope that we can, that tomorrow will be smarter and tomorrow will be better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations on your book there. I'm just going to switch gears for a second here. Mitch, you run an orphanage in Haiti. So how are things going there for you and the kids? Well, uh, that is a switch. Uh, uh, I, have, I have run a, an orphanage in Haiti since uh, January. Well, I've been there since January of 2010. So for 14 years now, I'm there every month. Um, we have about 60, 65 kids in any given time. Uh, we don't adopt any of our kids out. Uh, when they come to us, then they just stay with us and through food and love and nourishment and, and faith, uh, we educate them. Uh, they go to school four hours in English and four hours in French every day. And so far, every one of our kids has graduated through our school and has come to the States on a scholarship, uh, to study at universities. One of our kids is in medical school even. And, uh, and then all of them return when they're done to the orphanage and work there for two years to give back to the place that raised them and then go into Haiti and hopefully make their country a better place. 
Our orphanage is thriving in terms of the kids are fantastic and amazing. The country is in terrible, terrible shape. It's an extremely dangerous place. Second poorest country in the world, poorest on this side of the world. And you can't go anywhere because of the gangs. Our kids have not left the orphanage in over three years. Three years, they can't go outside. And we have to take bodyguards and bulletproof vehicles just to get from the airport to the orphanage when we come in. It's terrible. And the fact that no one is helping and the UN tried to put together some kind of force, it just fell apart, we just found out. And so there's not even going to be that help. And it's 700 miles off of our shores. And, you know, it's it's an hour and a half ride from from Miami to get there in a plane. And, and we're not doing anything about it. We're not helping them. And it's 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 criminal in my mind. And, uh, you know, I, I do what I can, you know, uh, with the kids, but it needs, the country needs a lot more help. Yeah. Very, very challenging situation over there. And, and oh, like that's a whole other topic on its own that we can go on and oh, on about. I'm happy to talk about it. I love talking about our kids. I'm yeah. sure you do. I'll we'll have to book you back again because we're out of time here, but, um, thank you so much for being with us today. And also thank you so much for the work that you do in Haiti. It, it's, you're amazing. Well, that's that's a privilege. Uh, I don't need to be thanked for that. It's it's an honor to be able to work with those kids. And I thank you for taking time to talk to me about my work and my book. And I hope I get a chance to see you again sometime. Uh, me as well. Thank you so much for being with us. Mitch Album is the author of The Little Liar, available at mitchalbum.com.